Hi, everybody. It's Mike from Here, the Watchman, and we're back today. Jeannie and I had a wonderful weekend up in uh, Court Belaine, Idaho, uh, where we attended the uh, Chuck Missler's conference up there, uh, which was uh, just amazing. Uh, uh, we had a good time at it, learned a lot. Now, and we're going to come back to you with Messianic Rabbi Zev Parat, and this is part two of his testimony, which he began last week. Uh, and you can see that on our YouTube channel. I do want to make sure you all know, Zev will be with us March 22nd through the 25th, Dallas, Texas, 2018. He is going to be one of the speakers. I get several emails from you uh, folks and comments asking if he will be there. He will be there. Now, folks, get your tickets by November 15th. You can enjoy the early bird special pricing until then. It's $99 per ticket. After November 15th, the price per ticket goes up $20 each. So you can save, if you're a couple, $40. Uh, uh, go to here, the watchman, M -E -N .com. Uh Check it out there. Uh, you can buy your ticket, and you can hear everything that's going on. I also want to say a huge thank you and hello and welcome to our brother John in Norway, who I actually met, came up to me at the conference up here in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and said, are you Mike from Here the Watchman? And uh, we shared he's been uh, watching our YouTubes, uh, he's been watching our conferences uh, via live streaming, and John, I want to give you a big shout out. Uh, we, we know you made it home safe, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing you in Dallas. So without any more to do, let's bring Zev on. Zev, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Oh, thank you for having me again, Mike. Always the blessing, as I always say. Zev, you know, I, I we had you on last week. What an amazing testimony that you have. Uh, I'm not kidding you, and I, I told all of our viewers this, it was the uh, most touching and important interview that I have done uh, since starting this channel over a year ago, and I think there's, I don't know, 375, 400 interviews that I've done, uh, and it really reached me, touched me, and I know it touched our viewers. We're going to go with part two. You left off, uh, you were uh, working at a restaurant somewhere in Israel as a dishwasher. You had uh, been basically ostracized by your family because you had accepted Yeshua. Uh, and uh, you ended up living in a tent on the beach with your wife and working in this uh, restaurant uh, for a Palestinian, of all things, who used to somewhat try and egg you on and you wouldn't take it and you started speaking to him about Yeshua and preaching the gospel. And if I'm not mistaken, he ended up accepting Jesus. Is that right? Well, praise God, Mike. You know, we give all the glory to Jesus. We still on for everything. Uh, yes, I was living, I'm living on the and um, working as a dishwasher. And in the midst of the, working as a dishwasher, this guy, Ali, his name is Ali, get saved, praise God, and he washing dishes together, a beautiful picture of the one new man, Ephesians 2.15, and the whole kitchen is getting the gospel in the restaurant. I mean, this is something only God can do, and Ali right now is in a congregation, an Arabic congregation in Haifa, north of Israel, and his testimony, as I shared last week, is a Jewish dishwasher preached the gospel uh, to me, so it's just wonderful to see how God moving. So I'm working as a dishwasher, um, living on the beach, and I'm on the beach in Tel Aviv, and I mentioned last week that I used to guard the tent for three hours, and my wife used to uh, sleep, and I, and I slept for three hours, and she used to guard the tent day after day doing this. And after this event that happened, God, God speaks to me, and he says, honor your mother and father. Honor your mother and father. And one thing I want to bring out about this Bible verse in Exodus 20, verse 12, which says, honor your mother and father. This is not a salvation issue, Mike. But I believe that God wants us to honor our mother and father. And we may be saved if we don't do it, but God wants us to be well. And if we don't honor our mother and father, we won't be well. And I believe God wanted me to be well. 
See, my, my whole family disowned me. But the only one that was in a little bit contact with me was my mom. She wanted me to contact her once a month or once every two weeks and say Shabbat Shalom on Friday, you know, just to know that I was all right. And she always said, don't talk to me about the Tanakh, about the Bible. Your God and my God are not the same. Your Bible and my Bible are not the same. But she expected me to do that. And I've been on the beach for over two months right now. And I haven't called my mom. And God speaks to me. And he uses the Bible verse, Exodus 20, verse 12, honor your mother and father. So I understood that God wants me to call my mom. So I Friday before sundown, I called my mom up. And I said, Mom, Shabbat Shalom. And my mother asked him, I haven't heard from you. Where have you been? And I said, I told her what happened. And you would think a mother's heart, she would hear that her son is living on the beach like a dog. She would grieve. She would be upset. But no, she was happy, Mike. She said, I warned you about this. I told you that if you believe in this Jesus guy, you would be destroyed. Look what you have done. You have lost your home. You have lost your family, you have lost your friends, and you have lost your identity. I said, Mom, God is going to bless me. And she just closed the phone. She was just upset. But the Bible says, honor your mother and father. So God reminded me to do that. doesn't matter what the other side is doing. And that was a Friday. Now, Sunday, Mike, 12 o'clock at night, seven rabbis from the main rabbinic movement of Israel approach my tent two of them i recognize from television one of them is in government today with benjamin netanyahu ali adeli he approached my tent and obviously my mom told me told them that i was there otherwise they wouldn't know and how did they find me you may be asking well if you go to tel aviv even today one two o'clock in the morning you're not going to find any tents on the beach nobody nobody lives in tents so i was the only tent there it was very very easy to find me and they, go, they, they walk into my tent, Mike, and I thought that they came to break my legs and my arms when I saw them. And they said, Zev, we're not here to fight. You made a mistake. You're supposed to be a rabbi. Come with us. We'll get you cleaned up. We'll get you a place to live. You know what? We're the Sanhedrin. We'll even get your old job back. You know what? We'll double your salary five times. Every loss of money that you have will pay you five times more. And they pull out a check, Mike, and I'm going to be speaking in dollars in this interview because, you know, the currency in Israel is shekel, just so the viewers understand. Uh, and please understand that the amount of monies that I'm speaking about in this interview, it was a lot more money at that time than it is today. And they pull out a check about 26000 U.S. dollars, and they say, come with us. And I looked at them, Mike, and I said, God bless you. God bless you. But I will never deny the name of Yeshua. I will never deny the name of Yeshua. Mike, and they spit on me. They didn't touch me. They cursed me. They cursed our Savior, and they left. The following, the following Friday, I called my mom up, honoring mother and father, and my mom said, Zev, what's wrong with you? She admitted to me. She said, we tried to help you, but you just won't help yourself. I said, Mom, God is going to help me. Yeshua is going to help me. And she says, you're crazy. And she closed the phone. Well, I'm on the beach. I've, uh, I'm working as a dishwasher. I've been persecuted. I've been, I've been spit on. I've been rejected. What else can I go through? And, you know, one thing I want to uh, encourage the, the viewers around the world is this, Mike. God will never put you through something that you can't endure. God knows how much we can endure. When Jesus said... We can do all things through him. He knew what we can do. Now, maybe what I can endure and you can endure is not the same or somebody else. But God will never put you through something that you can't endure. Now, I may have felt at times that I can't take it anymore. But God always strengthened me. Keep on going. Keep on going. And one day God speaks to me again. You know, what else can I go through? And he says, Zeb, I'm not happy with you. And I said, God, what do you want me to do? You want me to dance? What do you want me to do? And he says, I called you to preach the gospel, and you have not been doing it. And I said, I preached to Ali. And he says, I called you to preach the gospel in the streets, in the mosques, in the homes, everywhere, and you have not been doing it. And I started to negotiate with God, like, like kind of like Moses negotiated with God. And I said, you know, God, my situation is not so good. 
you know, I'm living on the beach, you know, give me a break, I'll do it later. And God spoke to me, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, preach the word in season and out. And I'm just paraphrasing. And I understood that God is telling me, you preach the gospel no matter what your condition is. You don't preach the gospel when you live in a penthouse. You preach the gospel in season and out. So I understood that God is telling me to preach the gospel. Well, when you go to the Israeli army, Mike, every single soldier that gets drafted in the army gets a Old Testament. That you get drafted to the army, you get an Old Testament. And I and I use that Old Testament. If you go to my uh, my website and you look at the pictures of me doing evangelism, you'll see I'm, I'm carrying this little blue Bible always. And that's the same Bible I received in the IDF. I still use it today. And the reason I use it is because when we use a Bible in Israel, and if it says, for example, uh, you know, Bible Society from Christians or, you know, Holland or something, so they, they look at your Bible and they say, we don't want to read this as Christian. But I like to use the Bible that I get in the IDF because it's stamped by the rabbis. And they can't say it's not, it's not legitimate because they stamped it. So I always use that Bible in Israel when, when I preach the gospel. So I, I took that Bible. I'm, I'm living on the beach, and I take that Bible, and I go and preach the gospel, and I cross the street of the, uh, the area, of the beach area in Tel Aviv, and I want to you know, give a picture to the viewers, for those who were not in Israel yet. Tel Aviv is a very secular city. It's not like Jerusalem. It's open 24 hours a day. There's restaurants. It, it's, it's, very, it's kind of like a, like a Jewish New York, if you want to call it. And... Um, I'm preaching, I'm sharing the gospel with a man in his late 50s, and I'm reading a Bible verse to him, and out of nowhere, Mike, this guy punches me. He punches me, and I fall down. Now, there were young people over there, 20, 25 years old, that saw this event. They assumed that I did something to this man. So they came over, and they started kicking me and punching me, Mike. And before you knew it, you know, Jewish people are very curious people. There was a big riot there, about 100 people over there. Two minutes later, the police come over, Mike. They didn't ask me any questions. They just put handcuffs on me. They handcuffed my hands and my feet. And I'm lying on the floor. Everybody's listening. And, they, and the policeman just points down at me like this. And he says, why did you assault this man? And I'm lying on the floor. And I said, I, I didn't assault this man. I, I shared the Tanakh, the, the Bible with him. And he hit me. So he walks over to this man. Everybody's listening. And he says, did you hit him because he shared the Tanakh? And this man walks over to me. I'm, I'm laying on the floor. He stands near the policeman. He points down to me next to everybody. And he says, this man's a traitor. He's not a Jew. Take him away and take his ID card away. Well, the policeman, he hears this. He immediately bends over. He opens the handcuffs, Mike, and I stand up. Everybody's listening. And he says, this man has admitted to assaulting you. I want you to go to the police station right now and file a complaint against him. And I look at the policeman, and I say, I'm not going to file a complaint against him. I forgive him, for he does not know what he does. And you know what, Mike, at that moment, silence broke. No one can speak. All those people that beat me up, and, and the policeman, and this man that was persecuting me, they couldn't speak. And I walked away, Mike. I just crossed the street and walked away. And I said to myself, I said to God, I was talking to myself, but I was talking to God. I said, God, I preach the gospel. I preach the gospel. Sometimes preaching the gospel is not just opening a Bible verse, but it's our own testimony of, of our own life of how we conduct our life. Jesus spoke about this. Yeshua spoke about this. He said, do this so people will know that you are my disciples. I, I have a new obstacle now. I'm living on the beach, Mike. I'm married to a, I'm married to a woman from, uh, from the nations. I'm working as a dishwasher, and I'm still looking for another job, as I said before, after that other job, and I, have a, I now have a black eye. So how do you look for a new job with a black eye? It's not a very good testimony. Well, I got to tell you, Zev, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing to, to, to listen to you talk about this. I, too, went through something similar. Uh, I wasn't preaching the gospel though, um, but but just beaten down and all that. And and I mean, tell our listeners, you know, <clears throat> you must have had moments during this journey where you wanted to give up. You you've lost your family, you've lost your job, 
you're living on the beach and 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 i lived on the beach too and people used to say well that means must be kind of nice you lived down at the beach no i lived on the beach you know uh just like you and your wife did there must have been times you wanted to just give up what carried you through how did you endure that pain how did your wife endure that pain and the two of you continue you know, there there are many times that in the flesh I wanted to give up, but I I can't give you an answer. All I can say, Mike, is is that the power of the Holy Spirit just enabled me to keep on going and keep on going. God knew what He had in store for me, and He just gave me the the power to do the impossible. I mean, it, it's impossible to to do what I did as a human being. It had to be the power of the Holy Spirit that enabled me to do it. You ask about my wife. Well, my wife is from an Oriental culture, and in 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 the Oriental culture, not in the believing world, but in the non-believing world, they have what's called, you know, losing face. If you, that means like they're, they can't, she can't call her family and say, I'm living on the beach. That would be a disgrace. So she had to be quiet and, and God used that situation in order to let her keep on going and going. So I think it's kind of like, it's all together, but that's, that's kind of the picture. Because, you know, what you Wow, and now, yeah. so, so now, now you've got a black eye you're living on the beach you're looking for another job where does where does yeshua take you from there i'm living on the beach you think what else can i go through i'm approaching slowly slowly i'm getting close to three months not yet and my grandfather dies the head of the sanhedrin now you have to ask yourself how did i know that my grandfather died well because he's the head of the sanhedrin it was posted all over bulletin boards the head of the sanhedrin Rabbi Pinchas Ford died, so I knew it. So obviously, he disowned me, but as I said earlier, he in the last segment, he was like a father to me. And I was going to go to the funeral. And, and Mike, when I arrived to the, to the cemetery, I was in total shock. My family hated Jesus, Yeshua, so much that during the time of mourning, during the time of grief, Mike, they can even think about hiring two big Russian security guards. I mean, they knew I was going to come. These were giant men, Mike. I'm talking about 6'10", maybe 7 feet tall. Giant men like this, okay? Huge guys. And when I walked into the cemetery, my family pointed at me. They said, that's him, that's him. And these two big Russian security guards walk over to me. I'm about down under, under the shoulder. And they look down at me and they say, you are not welcome here. You need to leave now. And I remember I, look up, I looked up at him like that and I said, I'm not leaving. He was like a father to me. And Mike, one from the right, one from the left, they pick me up, Mike. They physically take me out of the cemetery and they throw me out like a bag of hot potatoes. And I can, and I can tell you, Mike, it wasn't the physical pain. It wasn't. I, it was the spiritual pain. And I can tell you that I was crying, but I wasn't crying because of a lack of forgiveness. I was crying to the Father to forgive them. For their salvation because they don't know what they, they do not know what they do and i just left uh, it was i remember it it was like it, it was the worst thing you can ever experience mike uh, to go through something like that we don't have a a movie here to show it i'm trying to visualize it visual it to the viewers as much as i can but it, it was it was a bad situation very bad situation especially everything that i've been going through and i'm i'm almost three months on the beach and and 10 days later i had a a phone that my mom had the phone number what's called a like a prepaid uh, phone number that you buy in the post office and I get a phone call from my grandfather's attorney and he says Zev you're a rich man and I was you know you when you get a phone call like that and you're living on the beach you don't know what to say I I'm stuck even now <laughs> you don't know what to say. You know, and and he says, you're the oldest of the grandchildren, and therefore you have inherited your father's estate. You replaced your father. You're a rich man. Now, you need to understand something, Mike. My, my grandfather was the head of the Sanhedrin. He was a very rich man. When Judas was given 30 pieces of silver by the Sanhedrin to betray Jesus, Yeshua, that was a lot of money. The Sanhedrin have always been rich. I knew it was... This was huge. And I was so excited. I really believe this is my ticket out of the beach. 
I'm, this is my ticket. And two days later, I had an appointment with him. I walk in and I expected to see the whole family there because, you know, when you read a family, uh, a family will anywhere in the world, the, the family needs to be there. But nobody was there. It was only he and I. And I, I, I'm sitting in his office and the attorney's taking out the will and he starts to read the will, Mike. Your grandfather left you the synagogue. Your grandfather left you assets. He left you half of his house. My grandfather lived in a 1,200 meter mansion. You're talking 600 meter. That's millions of dollars. Your grandfather and left you a one and a half million dollars in cash. That was it's a lot of money now, but can you imagine then? And your grandfather uh, left you also money in the bank, 13, 14 million dollars. Now there were assets also. I can tell you the assets were worth at least. I'm not even a real estate guy. It's at least $40 million, Mike, if not more. And as he's reading this list to me, Mike, I have to tell you, um, I, my leg my, was shaking under the bed. That's, that's a lot of money. You know, I was shaking. You know, uh, and he pulls out another document, and he says, I want you to tell me who the signature on this document is. And I said, look, this is, I, I recognize the signature. It's my grandfather's signature. I knew who my grandfather's signature was. And he says, your grandfather is in the grave, but he wants to give you an opportunity to save yourself. If you sign here that Jesus, Yeshua, is not the Messiah, the money's yours. And I looked at him and I said, I will never deny the name of Yeshua. I will never deny the name of Yeshua. And he looks at me and he says, look, I'm an attorney. I want my compensation. I want my money. I really don't care what you believe. You can believe in Cinderella. Sign the document and take the money. No one will know. I won't tell anybody. Nobody's here. I said, you're wrong. The God of Abraham, Isaacs, and Jacob is here. He is here. And the attorney looks at me and he says, do you understand that if you do not sign this document, the court will will give this money out to your family. And I told them that's okay. But remember to tell them that Jesus, Yeshua, gave them the money. And I know for a fact that my sister is a very, very rich woman now. She's living, she's got this huge penthouse in Tel Aviv and, and another house somewhere else. But the Bible says in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Our treasures are not in this world. We look for treasures in, in, in the kingdom. So I left his office, and you know, I thought it was my way out of the beach, but it wasn't. And I had to go back and tell, and tell Lynn, you know, <laughs> we got a lot of sand over here, but no money. And I and, and basically tell her what happened. And it, it was difficult, you know, it was difficult. And I'm, I'm three months on the beach already, and I decide to go to Jerusalem to pray. And where did I decide to go? I decided to go to the garden tomb. The garden tomb in Jerusalem is the symbolic place where Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, and I go over there to pray. And you have to ask the question. I've been asked this question many times. Where was the Messianic movement at that time? And why didn't you contact them? Well, the person that was witnessing to me on the Internet, Todd, he kind of warned me. He said, you know, there are people that do, they have gifts. They have this. I was an Orthodox Jew. I didn't understand anything about these things, and I was scared. So I was really scared to contact anybody. And the only place that I really felt the presence of the Holy Spirit where I could pray was the Garden Tomb in Jerusalem. So obviously I, I took a bus and I went up to Jerusalem. I didn't take that car because that car can make it to Jerusalem, but it can't come back. So, so I took that bus and went up to Jerusalem, and I'm, I'm sitting in the Garden Tomb in, in Jerusalem on a bench over there, and I'm, I'm – praying and crying and praying. And a man from Australia by the name of Alan Kerr approaches me. And he says, are you a Messianic Jew? And I said, yes, I am. He said, the Holy Spirit told me to come and speak with you. And I sat down there with Alan Kerr for two and a half hours in the garden tomb, uh, Mike, just sharing my story, praying with him and crying. And he took my phone number. It was a Thursday afternoon, Mike. He said, God is going to bless you. The following Monday, Mike, God poured seven days 
of supernatural blessings in my life. Now, seven is a number of perfection. It's a number of God. God created the world in six days. He rested on the seventh day. Seven times seven, 49 sundown is jubilee. So there's a significant meaning why God poured seven days of supernatural uh, blessings on my life. First blessing I received, Mike, I received a phone call from a bank in Israel. And they say an insurance company wants your phone number. Can we give them your phone number? I said, look, I'm living on the beach. You can give them whatever you want. 4.30 in the afternoon, Mike, the same day, I received a phone call from Klal Bitua, the biggest insurance company in Israel, and they say, Zev, we have a check for you for 11,000 US dollars. And I asked them, where's the check from? And they say, well, you deserve it from 10 years ago. I didn't deserve anything, Mike. I knew where that money came from. That money came from heaven. In Israel and probably even in the States, if you deserve money and you don't know about it, nobody tells you about it. So this is something supernatural. Wow. I, I just, now, when that, I mean, first of all, you know, I, I mean, how many people would sit in front of an attorney like that, staring at $40 million while they're living on the beach and having the attorney say, nobody will ever know about this if you sign it. And you having the fortitude to know that God was watching and 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 then to go through this experience and pray and and to all of a sudden get a check for eleven thousand dollars at that point what is did that re-energize you and did you move forward from there well I knew right there the hand of God is upon me you know I didn't uh, I didn't say hey God why eleven thousand there was forty million there you know I think that wasn't what, what was going through my mind but what was going through my mind was if God opened this door, then God has something for me. He's not going to leave me here on the beach. That was my thinking. And I, I ran down to uh, uh, the insurance company, and praise God, Tel Aviv is a very small place. You can literally pass from one side of the city to the other on a bicycle in 20 minutes. So I arrived to the uh, insurance company, and the secretary pulls out a, a check. And on the check, Mike, there's two lines, two lines. Two lines in Israel means that it needs to be deposited in to a bank account and that takes three to four business days before you can cash it in so I told the secretary I've been on a beach for three and a half months I've had enough business days I'm not waiting another three four days and the Bible says in many places but one of the places that I like to God is showing me is the book of Esther chapter 7 verse 3 and 4 where it says that the favor of the non-believer will fall upon the believer and I proclaim that on everybody that's listening today. Whatever you're going through, you remember that Bible verse, Esther chapter 7, verse 3 and 4, that the favor of the non-believer will, will fall upon you. And I tell the secretary this, and she literally gets up. She knocks on a meeting of the biggest CEO in, in, in Israel, company, just walks in there, and she asks him to sign the check. So he signs on top of the, you know, the, the crosses, which means I can go to the bank and withdraw the money with an ID card without waiting three, four days. And I, I take this check, Mike. I call Lynn up, and I said, Lynn, I don't have time to explain. God has blessed us. Meet me in Remux, in Ramad Gan. Remux is a, is a uh, real, real estate agent. And I run to the bank. The banks in Israel close at 6.30 p.m. on a Monday. I arrive to the bank at 6.26 p.m. That's four minutes before closing, Mike. And I can tell you that if they would have had cameras there, they would have thought I was a bank robber. I took that money, Mike, and I, I just took the money and I ran, Mike. Wow. I, I mean, that is, that is amazing, Zev. What a, what a testimony. What a story. Uh, well, it's not a story. It's the truth. Uh, you know, folks, you don't understand sometimes what what God puts us through. Uh, you know, people have asked me Zev, this question. They've said, Mike, if you could go back and change everything, if you could, if you could come back and change your life and not have to go through the things that you went through, what would you do differently? Now, my answer is always not a thing because I believe that it took every single thing that I had to go through 
that God had his hand on me. God led the way during that. And it was to form me into the man for the Lord that I am today. What about you? If you could go back and change anything, would you? I would not, I would not change a thing. Uh, like you, Mike, I mean, God prepared me. You know, I always ask the question, Moses had to be 40 years in the wilderness. 40 years in the wilderness, why? God was preparing him for something. I had to be three and a half months on the beach. Why? God was preparing me for something. You had to go through something. You were being prepared. You know, fire purifies gold and silver. Sometimes we have to go through the fire. And if we're willing to go through the fire, God will purify us. If we're not willing, then God can't use us. And I think that uh, that's, that's for everybody, for anybody that's going through anything out there today, if you're a believer in Jesus, God has something for you, something big. But you got to go through the fire sometimes. But God will purify you. So, and you have an amazing testimony, Mike. I've been sharing your testimony everywhere. It's, it's just, I mean, it's not my testimony. It's not your testimony. It's Yeshua's testimony. That's what it is. Amen. Amen, Zeb. And we, we need to remember that, you know, that, that there are times, uh, you and I have talked about this, there are times that I'm embarrassed to share my testimony because I fear judgment. Uh, you know, we're all human. We fear judgment at times. But it's not my testimony. It's Yeshua's testimony. It's, it, it's his gift to all of us. Uh, and, and so we, we need to be vigilant in sharing this. So, you know, we're running out of time today, Zeb, and, and Zeb's going to be back on a regular basis, um, uh, sharing with us and guiding us as we, as we go through these times ahead. We're, what's going on with you today? What, what is your ministry doing, and how can people find you? Well, first of all, we got part three of this where we got another, at least another 20, 25 minutes to share. So we got to do part three because the story gets really interesting how God brought me into ministry. Um, Messiah of Israel Ministries.org, which is the ministry God gave to us. And uh, tune in next time to find out how he gave it to us. It's quite a remarkable story. And we, we share the gospel in Israel, uh, in the streets, in the mall, in the houses. But we also have discipleship program, training programs where we train new believers, non-believers, Arabs, Muslims. We have a ministry to the Holocaust survivors, to the idea of soldiers, to widows. We have a hospital ministry. Basically, we, we preach the gospel in every way we can. Uh, even if we give out food vouchers, remember what Jesus said, man should not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. So whatever we do, we, we're not ashamed of the gospel. We preach the gospel first. We put the kingdom first. And... Uh, we are persecuted for it, but there's a lot, a lot of salvations also, praise God. And it's thanks to believers like you, Mike, and the viewers around the world that are, are standing with us and enabling us uh, spiritually and even financially to do this. And, uh, you know, a shout out to the people. Thank you for uh, being part of this, uh, this ministry and being part of Israel. Well, Zeb, God bless. And, 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 and it truly is an honor to serve Yeshua alongside you and to to uh, be out there and, and to, to have a brother like you. Thank you so much for, for joining us today and everything that you're doing. Well, thank you. I mean, the Here the Watchman conferences are very, very important because they unite people together. They not only get the word out, but they bring fellowship and unity together. And I've met a lot of, a lot of great, wonderful brothers and sisters in these conferences and just a lot of emails with a lot of people. So just opens doors, and I think it's good for, for the body and for everybody, and I pray that God will enable you to do even more conferences, uh, and I know he will. Well, and he is. You know, don't, let's not forget, folks, you want to go to our website, click the Israel Tour button. In October of 2018, here the Watchman will be joining Pastor Paul Begley and his ministry, and Messianic Rabbi Zev Parad. They're in Israel for a tour. So if you, can, if you can be a part of that, you really ought to. You'll be blessed. Zev's going to talk uh, during the tour at the, at the dinners. And just it's going to be an amazing, amazing journey for the 70th anniversary of the State of Israel. So please uh, go there, check it out. Zev, we'll see you again next week for part three uh, of, of this interview series where, where you'll talk about uh, where you left? Where we left off? You you have eleven thousand dollars, and and now you're on your way to serve Jesus even more than you already are, and uh, and so we're looking forward to that. To everybody out there, again, here 
thewatchmenmen.com. Go there, check it out. Uh, let us bless you with the teachings of, of uh, Jesus, and come on out to Dallas and get involved in the fellowship. And until I see you next time here on the Watchman's Report, remember, you can do absolutely anything with Jesus in your heart, except nothing at all. So get out there, get busy, serve him, watch what happens to your life. We'll see you next week with Zev here again on The Watchman's Report. God bless. Thank you.